All right. Well, welcome to the PNW Peak Baggers podcast. I'm Bill Goodgen. I'm the founder of PNW Peak Baggers and your host. Um, this episode promises to be an interesting one. Our guest has uh, started off by telling me this is going to be a crazy story of escape and refugee camps and commies and Kim Jong Un and climbing mountains. So, with us is Maria Masiar. Maria, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Bill. It's good to see you. So let's just uh, talk a little bit about her background. Maria has uh, been in the mountains pretty much since she could walk. Um, she's from uh, communist Czechoslovakia. Um, so then yeah. it's going to be interesting to talk about. And she's been everywhere from the Tatra Mountains to the Rockies to the Cascades now in the Pacific Northwest. She lives in Vancouver or out, just outside Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver. Yep. Um, and so mountains have been a constant thread in her life and part of her journey of discovery um, in both the outdoors and herself. She has 30 years of mountaineering, skiing, both downhill and backcountry. She's a climber. She's a scrambler. She's a hiker. And of course, she's a peak bagger, um, which way is why we have her on here. Um, she's She's actually kind of a relatively new member to PNW Peak Baggers, um, but she jumped right in. She's been posting and commenting and engaging members. She is an active member of, we like to call them kind of our sister uh, Peak Bagger group on the other side of the border, the Southwest BC Peak Baggers. We love that group. So we'll put a little oh. shout out in for them as well. Lots Woo. of members in both groups. Um Beyond her day-to-day -day job of running design and user experience team, she's a volunteer for uh, one of the busiest search and rescue teams in all of North America. Um, she puts in over 500 hours a year. Um, she's actually part of a cool little docu-series on TV that's uh, focused on her search and rescue group as well. Um She's part of the Alpine Club of Canada and the British Columbia Mountaineering Club, the BCMC, um, where she's taught women in mountain women in mountaineering. She's taught glacier glacier travel courses and talks about snow safety. Um, she loves to do trail work, cutting down alders when she's not doing all of these other things. I don't know where you have time for that. Something about having a favorite silky saw i'm interested to learn more about that and she did share with me writing a poem about her favorite loa boots so <laughs> maria that's a lot so where do we start with that do we start <laughs> with uh the crazy story of escape crazy in story. 1987 when you and your family flee uh flee to austria right yeah um yeah it's a good place to start as any so you know a lot of the times i get asked why i joined search and rescue in the first place and i think for everyone it's a super personal reason um everybody sort of has a journey to get there and everybody has a journey as to why they stay and mine was um a convoluted path you know to to get to that point but mountains like as you described have been a part of my life since I was a child, um, you know, certainly in in what was former Czechoslovakia, my most earliest formative memories were hiking with grandma in the Tatra Mountains, right? And they're right on the border there with Poland. Um, and there's some really spectacular terrain. And that's where we first learned to downhill ski. And and even now when I've gone back to visit, you know, those so how, how old were you then when you first learned how to ski? Three, three years oh, wow. old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, literally, as soon as we could pretty much walk, dad had us had us on um, a pair of skis. And so that was kind of the family thing to do. That's what we did with our family times. And I think some people go, you know, fishing or they played board games. Our family thing was to go outdoors. And that was kind of a constant growing up. Um, and so when I was around the age of seven, it was pretty turbulent times back then. It was still under Russian control. And when I was a little kid, you know, there was like Lenin and Stalin posters above my crib. And it was for wow. realsies, like thought crime. Um, you know, if you made a joke about the, the Communist Party, people would vanish. 
Um, that was a very real part of our lives, you know, worrying about what could be thought, what could be said, what could be read. And so it was kind of an environment that for obvious reasons, my, my, my folks didn't think was a great place to grow up. And so, um, my mom was, was, I think the, the, you know, the spark that, that sort of led, um, an idea that she maybe wanted a little bit of a better life for her kids. Um, and they put everything on the line. And so when we were little, um, somehow we got it, you know, they didn't let like, they, they never let families leave the country, not ever. They knew the moment that people crossed that border, it was game over. They were never returning. Right. And so visas weren't given out for families to go out. So I think we had some convoluted story. We said we were going for a vacation to Italy. And of course we snuck on a train and went in the exact opposite direction. And we snuck on a train to Vienna and between, um, Vienna and Bratislava, they're the two closest capitals in the world. Um, they're like 50 kilometers apart. And that's a really close distance. So we get on a train and how we much end up did in- you did you, how much did you really understand and know as a child what you were doing? I mean, was it really clear what was happening to you? Or did your parents no. try and shield you a little bit from that? Yeah, for sure. Um uh, and also kids are brutally honest, right? So if any formal <laughs> official if anybody asked, ask. <laughs> going. Right. <laughs> um yeah, I probably wouldn't have gone over well. And and really you just didn't. You didn't tell even your closest friends or and you didn't tell your closest family because what ends up happening is as soon as they find out that you're gone, the KGB comes after whoever is left, right? Right, so, which happened in your case. They came and went yeah. right to your family, right? Yeah. yeah. So if they can't get a hold of you, they go and they go put, you know, dial up the pressure on who's ever left behind. And so um, really, you don't want to put your friends and family members in a position where they can be compromised or where they know too much, right? You kind of want to leave sure. them to work. So. Like so it looked like parents, you were going on vacation to everybody, including you, including the kids. <laughs> yeah, like pack up your bag, kids. We're going to Italy. Um, and then, you know, we end up in in Vienna and it's and it's I remember, you know, sort of the the early kind of city life there, making our way to this big giant military barracks with cement walls and barbed wires and and people had been in this camp for for multiple years, right? For um, making all kinds of applications. When you get there, you're a political refugee, um, and you don't really have status, so you can't work legally in the country. You're waiting for paperwork and your applications to come through, and that's dependent on the classic like point system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how healthy are you? How, what kind of education do you have in markets that are of interest to the country that you want to immigrate to? How young are the children? Can they adapt to the culture? Can they learn the language, right? So English is not my first language. You know, that was like Slovak and Russian, um, which were kind of uh, the first languages in school, little bits of Czech, because that was our, our TV programming. And then I only learned English when, when we finally came to Canada. Um, and wow. not it took about a year, right? I remember living in this military barracks. We had these bunk beds. Um, and at the time, I think because I was shielded with my family, um, I didn't really understand the gravity of what was happening. I didn't understand that my parents had to put everything on the line, that they left everything that they yeah. ever knew. Friends, family, jobs, like all the familiar. It's very, very brave and and frightening at the same time, I'm sure pretty terrifying like the consequences if you got caught was basically your parents go to jail and my brother and I would have been in an orphanage um and so yeah there's you know there's there's definitely consequences to it and then you know then you get followed forever because you're you're seen as a bad communist you're not following the party line and so um for those who got left behind um like my grandfather at the at the time was heading the largest oil and gas company in in Bratislava and you know they immediately sort of force you to resign like you can't hold that position anymore because your daughter escaped and by extension you're a bad human being you can't you can't be in that position anymore wow uh, so consequences definitely across the board um come along and you know they come and try to find you they ransack the apartment they went through all of our goods they stole pretty much everything that we had. Um, and so you mementos from my early childhood pretty much don't exist, you know, um, photos and 
you know, black and white and the things that some people get to hold on to. Um, I certainly didn't, didn't have as a kid. My, my start was pretty rough. Um, you're, and um, and I, I wouldn't say fortunate, um, but compared to others, from what I understand, you guys were able to pick up uh, political refugee status pretty quickly com com compared to others. I mean, a year is a long, long time when you're in those conditions and you're away from your friends and your family and away from your home. But um, you were fortunate that Canada granted you the status and they were kind enough to even let, loan you the money to fly to Canada and start yeah. your life over. Yay, Canada. Yeah, it's like an IOU. So at the time, yeah. if you were a political refugee, obviously, you kind of had nothing, right? And so I remember um, one day when it was almost time to fly to Canada on my dad's birthday, I, I was walked into this room and it had a series of winter jackets. And they said, go ahead, you can pick whichever one you want. And my eyes went really wide and there was <laughs> the 80s. So there was some really cool neon green stuff <laughs> out with a little bit of shiller. And then there was this, you know, this kind of this navy blue one with little stars. And I, of course, being a kid, I was like, it's all about the neon green. So I took <laughs> the neon green with my brother. And, and it was, you know, this jacket that I was was gifted um, the first clothing that we ever had was based on donations and the things that the public yeah. would get. Um, and for sure, I would say we were of the lucky lot. Um, other people had much longer stays at the camp, depending on kind of what they had as jobs and careers. And my family happened to be in computers and in IT. That was a high demand thing in Canada um, in 1987. And so, you know, both my parents had a pretty high education there. And so we were kind of a I think that's why we got a little bit lucky is because the, there was kind of a good alignment there. Yeah, and the Soviet Union's crumbling right behind you at this time, right? Which, you know, it's hard to know that when yeah. you pull. So, yeah, the Velvet Revolution happened two years after that. Um, but again, it could have been four years, could have been 10 years. Could like, have been never. At yeah. the time, could have been never, could have been stuck. Um, like a lot of, you know, Eastern, former Eastern Bloc countries were stuck. Um, so you couldn't, it was, it was unknowable, right? You're, you're taking a gamble no matter what you do. Um, yeah. and it really was through, I think a lot of the kindness of strangers, um, that got us through the first days. And then, you know, when we landed in Canada, like my parents, it's typical, we lived in a really poor neighborhood. We, you know, didn't have a lot of money. Um, we got the first jobs that they could, it was kind of built up from there. Um, but the lesson for me there was that, you know, it kind of stuck with me this moment that people help people. And that's really kind of the spirit of the world in general. And um, as I grew older, I began to understand a bit more of what that actually meant, right, in, in life. Um, and it's an indebtedness to helping yeah. others. So, I mean, obviously, is carrying over to all this volunteering that you're doing for for SAR, Radical. for helping women and helping the community at large. Yeah, I think that's how we evolve as human beings. I think very early on in life, a lot of it is centered around ourselves and self. Um, a lot of the focus when you're a teenager or a young adult, it's kind of all about you. And then as you age and you figure out a little bit later that actually it's not about you at all. <laughs> I'm not the center of the universe. It's, it's really about other people and it's about the service of other people. And that brings really a greater joy and value um, to life. So basically the story went as, you know, I got older, I, um, through my career in IT, um, I was really fortunate. I ended up uh, working in the United Nations. Um, I was kind of there at the beginning of the internet, building some of the very first websites um, that the world had seen, you know, I think I built my first one when there's 500 websites online. And as a result, um, I had the opportunity to go build the first human rights website for the United Nations in Paris. And so I got there and I was this young woman who, how, had, how, how old would you have been? I was 23 point? years old, oh, wow. uh, which was what which an was, opportunity, <laughs> right? Which was absolutely crazy to be there at that time. Um, living in Paris and, you know, this, 
this young IT girl um, who knew something about coding and who knew something about Photoshop and who knew something about the internet. And here I am tasked with creating the first human rights website, um, which was an incredible opportunity. Like I, I, I learned a ton, um, but it was also one of these moments where I had a lot of naivety in terms of how I thought the world worked and being in the halls of the United Nations, you really find out what it's about, you know, how do things work behind the scenes on a global scale when it comes to human rights issues, people, um, the things that are going on. And we would receive all of these letters and these pleas and, you know, people asking for help. And do you even really sat in on the UN assembly, right? I did, yeah. And yeah, so it's crazy, I, which I would sit there and I would watch all of these debates and, you know, things that you, you and I would consider basic human issues that you just like, of course, that's going to get ratified. Things like child labor laws, like that's a no brainer. Who wants their five-year-old working in a factory? And really the reality on the ground is they're more like trading pieces. Russia will say to China, hey, if you really want us to ratify this, you need to change your vote on that. And so they became like these playing cards, not the human rights issue, um, which, which was super demoralizing to me. Um, especially because I felt like I had this lived experience. Um, you know, I had a crazy childhood. I knew what people were going through and the kind of help that, you know, they were seeking. And I felt like at the highest levels of the United Nations, um, that just really wasn't coming through to the ground level, right? Um, and is I, this when you, the part of the Kim Jong-un <laughs> yeah. yeah. part comes out where you had a chance to come face to face with the a notorious North Korean leader? Thankfully not. I've never met him in person. Oh, okay. I <laughs> want to. Um, you know, it came about in a, in a slightly different way. I sort of asked myself like, okay, so if I can't make an impact where I am now, how can I make an impact? What can I do to pay this this karmic debt in 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 a certain way to move to move things forward, you know, four members of my family got out. What can I do to to uh, to help somebody else? What is the craziest place on planet Earth that I know today? And and at the time, the answer was definitely North Korea. Like it was, you know, if if there's a thought crime or you watch a the, a movie you're not supposed to see, three generations of your family are basically incarcerated. You have children that are born in work camps that are enslaved essentially to the to the regime forever. Um, and it's 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 absolutely horrific, right? And and it still happens to this day. Um, people who do escape have a 3,000 mile journey from North Korea into South Korea. China doesn't recognize the Human Rights Act. So if you're caught, you're automatically repatriated, which either is back to the work camp or a bullet in the head. Um, mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, this is insane. Um, you know, this is a place that is like absolutely tugging at my heart. So I found an organization out of Los Angeles that helps them escape like middle of the night panel vans. Um, once they cross the Tuanamon River, um, they help them and they, they they give them some kind of bribery cash, like $500. Um, and it costs about in total, I think, $3,000 uh, to bring somebody through. And that's kind of a six month journey where they're going through an underground type of railway uh, where they have some basic settlement money. And I think the greatest kind of irony for me was that $3,000 is what the Canadian government once upon a time let my family to get on an airplane and start a new life. So that number had a kind of certain yeah. set of significance. It resonated with you quite well. Deeply. I was like, yeah. wait a minute, this seems like a really familiar sum. <laughs> um, and so I kind of made a simpler plea. I said, well, maybe I can't change the world, but maybe I can be the world for one person because I know that worked in my life. So how do I do that? Um, so I decided, okay, there's four members of my family. Um, and so how do I rescue, you know, four people from North Korea and give them the same opportunity that I got in life? to have a new beginning, a different possibility. And so, uh, like I said, I kind of paired with this, this um, organization out of, um, out of Los Angeles. 
called Liberty in North Korea. And they would literally send like a white panel van in the middle of the night that would hide these people, shelter them, bring them through sort of safety zones and eventually get them, get them out. And I knew that most of these people, like we did, wanted to be anonymous. You know, I never sort of expected to ever hear from any one of them ever. Um, and it was a life changing event when I did. So how oh, did so the that happen? Wow. Yeah. So how did the mountains come about? So I was like, okay, three grand per person. I need to raise $12,000. How am I going to do this? What do I naturally sort of enjoy doing? Uh, what do I think I'm going to be able to keep up with for a little while? And I thought, well, you know, I mountains, how do I make mountains part of this? So I said, I will hike anything you want to a mountaintop and I will go every single weekend, rain or shine. I will hike to a mountaintop, any memento, whatever you want. Um, if you donate $50 to, to the campaign. And I have this little flag, this red flag. And every time somebody donated um, an amount to it, I would write their name on the flag. And I started this journey. And then off you go to bag some peak. Off, off, off. I literally, yeah, this is, this is, oh, I started here, which is our version of the, uh, the yeah. Scrambles book. Uh, Matt Dunn, <laughs> Sitting on my desk is the, the Washington, Washington Scrambles. Scrambles. <laughs> yeah, and I, so, so I started here. And, you know, every single weekend, um, and I started this journey at the same age that I was, um, uh, sorry, my, my daughter, I have a daughter who's seven years old, uh, when I started that journey, which was the same age that I was when I was oh, in the okay. back. And it was tough, I'm going to say, um, because I, as a mom, you're leaving your child every single weekend. Yeah. And you're hoping that one day what you're doing, they will understand. Right. And this journey, um, by the time I raised the, you know, the $12,000 took me three years. So three wow. years, every weekend, I went off for a day to do a mountain summit. Um, and I would hike something to the top. Um, you were and that's a probably yeah. trying to do different, different ones, right? You oh, yeah, were just yeah, doing yeah, the yeah. same one over and over. So oh, yeah, no, every, every week. So every yeah, week. your peak bagging journey <laughs> had started in a very <laughs> unusual way. Yeah. So the number of peaks started going up and up and up and up and yeah. up. And, uh, really the hope was that one day she would understand this journey that I had traveled and why I had traveled it. Um, and to really comprehend because, you know, she was going to grow up in a place that was safe and protected. Like Canada is not what, you know, the former Soviet bloc countries were. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a parent, you think about how do I make you understand that the world is bigger than your tiny little sphere, you know, that in fact, it's countries, it's people like multiple countries across this planet and what we do to one another really spans the globe. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to, to project forward as, as kind of the lesson to her. And so I started on this insane peak bagging journey. And I, you know, I got sometimes it was a photo of like, you know, my parents met here or this was their first date. And I want to recreate the photo for them on this mountaintop. Or can you go there again and, you know, take a picture for me of what it looks like now. Um, sometimes it was intensely personal, like I've ha um, hiked ashes um, to mountaintops to oh. you know, uh, send off loved ones to the four wow. winds, I say. Um, that would know, be they're, emotional. They're surprisingly heavy. I had no idea before <laughs> I got, you know, a box of ashes, uh, just how heavy that was of an item to hike up a mountain. Thankfully, nobody asked me to hike up a couch. Um, <laughs> so, uh, or um, uh, here on Mailbox Peak, uh, somebody <laughs> took a lime bike up uh, the Mailbox Peak and I, an exercise, a rowing machine, I think it was. Yeah, a row, rowing machine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, those days are done. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's been like 30 years of mountaineering. I'm getting old. So um, you combined these two passions um, and then, it sounds like clearly you've further developed your passion 
uh, for the mountains through this process, like this process of discovery and help. Yeah. And um, you finish off the raising the funds. And then did you, were you left with this feeling? Uh, I, like I, I've, I know a, a lot of athletes that train really hard for an event or even us mountain climbers that look forward to a big climb and then they fall into this kind of weird funk or depression after they complete whatever that goal is. Did that happen to you? Were you like, Oh my gosh, now what? Totally. It, it totally happened. So, you know, six months later, I got one of these letters from a pe from, from a person who actually made it um, from South Korea, had escaped, gone through the journey through China and had actually made it into North Korea. And I think I received that lever letter when I was at work and I just remember having a complete meltdown. Oh, I, I had bet. yeah, completely. Um, the how could you, how could you not? Right? It was just this absolutely overwhelming emotional journey that had come full circle for me. Um I had climbed the equivalent of 11 Mount Everests. You know, when people are like doing their 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 numbers of peaks or their tracking their vertical their annual vert <laughs> i was doing like a million feet of vertical like it, it was crazy amounts that i was hiking here um you know and, and the journeys in between and the bears and the glaciers and the accidents and like all the stuff that happens in the mountains you know it, it just all came full circle and i had this insane overwhelming emotional response when this letter came and of all the things i've ever done in my life I felt like this was the most selfless um, act that I have probably, you know, ever done and engaged in for such a duration of time. Um, and it was, it felt like the best thing I had ever experienced of, you know, despite. I can, I can see in your eyes and personal. hear in your vo <laughs> voice how meaningful it still is. It still is. And I asked myself, I'm like, it, it felt like discovering a new part of yourself. Um, and I asked myself, I'm like, this is, this is an incredible feeling. Um, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like another step towards enlightenment or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. How do I keep this feeling going? How do I keep this going forward? How do I make this a daily part of the values that I live? And because I had this, you know, three years of posts and like you said, you know, Southwest BC didn't come around for a long time before then there was this little forum called Club Tread and I would post all of these reports because there just were none. There were no women back then who were doing these kinds of crazy things that I knew of. Like, I swear to God, I was the only girl. And every mm -hmm. time I got one of these cryptic books, you know, whether it was the Becky guide and you get like one sentence and you're off on like, there's no detail, you know, all trails didn't exist. Um, right. You don't have a nice GPS on. coordinate to follow with, with a, tra a trail report from two days ago. <laughs> exactly. You're so on your own. So I felt like as a woman who was sometimes doing these journeys alone, who was going solo, um, you know, I felt really challenged out there. And I thought to myself, I was like, if I could help people even just a little bit with future trip reports and and guidance to where these routes go, that's going to make people's lives a little bit better. And so for three years, I would publish these reports. And then, you know, one day I, I, I get a message and um, folks who knew me sort of invited me and said, hey, you know, would you consider applying to search and rescue? I was like, you know, I think I would. That I, sounds like, perfect. It's got my mountains yeah. and I get to help people at the same time. Ha ha. <laughs> uh, so I did. So I, I, we have a local team here called um, North Shore uh, Search and Rescue. And uh, because we're close to Vancouver, which is a population of 2 million, it is one of the busiest teams, right? People can just wander off into the woods at any time. Yeah, I mean, surrounded by mountains within, yeah. you know, yeah. a very short distance, it creates a lot of uh, opportunity for people to make bad decisions. It does. And, and you get into the classic, you know, I wasn't sure um, how I was going to feel about it. Whenever you embark on a new journey, you don't really know you're taking a bet and you you kind of see. Were there any other women in the search and rescue team at that time? 
when I applied, there was two out of a okay. team of 40. Um, and so few, I, I wouldn't say it was exactly, you know, uh, <laughs> a, a, yeah, a I mean, too. I mean, I look at the, the demographics of, um, yeah. e even like our group, PNW peak baggers, it's, it's, um, slightly over half male, uh, which is probably, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing that's probably pretty representative of, you know, hikers and climbers that are out there. So certainly, search and rescue to only have a small percentage of two, you know, wouldn't be representative of the climbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thankfully, you know, it's becoming a little bit more normal. Um, I think as we see more reports coming out, more women getting out there on the forums, they're starting to build their courage a little bit. And it's one of the reasons why I keep, you know, giving my time and volunteering to the mountaineering clubs, the Alpine clubs, because so many times, you know, I get women who come and they're usually dragged out by their boyfriends and they don't necessarily like it, or they're just in <laughs> an environment that they don't feel comfortable in, right? They're yeah. walking behind some guy who's six foot five and, you know, the strides are this big as they're trying to go up a mountain and, 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 you know, like they just don't feel comfortable in that zone. So I've done a lot of, um, you know, dedicated, you know, intro women into mountaineering groups. And, and I, keep on taking or try to take people out um, in mentorship programs, whether that's sort of backcountry skiing or like when people just reach out on, on Facebook and say, hi, like, come join me. Um, I, I think most people initially are intimidated and I'm like, don't be, I am not a trail runner. I don't run fast up mountains. I just have a lot of stubbornness and will to get up there. Yeah. I'm not the fastest. I'm not the slowest. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, well, even, I, it, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time with people that are way, most of the time, people are way faster than I am. They're half my age. And so I expect that they will be. But, you know, you find that uh, people want to help. They're, it's it's part of the mountaineering community at large. I mean, not everybody. I mean, certainly there's people that have no desire and they're, they're doing their own thing. And, I, you know, I'm a solo person. I don't care to be around other people i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna bag my peaks climb my mountains but you know most most people are like very accepting of new people coming in they want to help they want to share their knowledge they're willing to slow the pace down teach people along the way and i think people are so afraid of that happening and so afraid of even giving it a shot they're like oh my gosh i can't go hang out with maria she's climbed hundreds and hundreds of peaks like that's too intimidating i certainly didn't start there yeah I that's it to you know vancouver i used to live in ontario in toronto and when i moved out here i kid you not bill i was scared to go out in the forest in the dark like, <laughs> that was... and now i look back and i'm like wow i've come so far i, I don't even think about it now you know yeah. it's a headlamp goes on boop 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 you know, you've got your systems dialed, but I mean, I really, it should be noted. Like we all start somewhere. Exactly. Um, yeah. So and, I've asked other people that I've talked to, what, what's your definition of a peak bagger? <laughs> How do you just, and uh, do you describe yourself to people as a peak bagger or are you afraid to say that? <laughs> I, I yeah, I guess I have reservations. I think I know like <laughs> diehard peak baggers and they will, you know, we'll call it dumpster diving, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> the worst of the worst terrain just to like check that checkbox. Um, I, feel I said that I said that to my wife the other day. I told her that I was going to go climb this trash peak and she's yeah. like, trash peak, what's that? And I'm like, no, that's not the name of the peak. It's just <laughs> It's a garbage peak. Like sure. there's, there's no reason that I want to go do it other than I want to check that box. And she's like, yeah. that makes no sense. Why would you do that? <laughs> well, and that just goes to the, like, so I'll answer the question, you know, was I there? I, I would say initially for sure, especially when I had the book and the book has a list and like every weekend, every time, you know, I did something off of it, you know, I'd bust out my highlighter 
and every one of them. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> and so it's, as soon as it came, I was like eager to rush home and take out my highlighter and take it off the list. So, you know, whether it's a book, um, whether it's the Bulgars peak, you know, whether it's a list, most people that are peak baggers have a list. Right? They're working something. Yeah, They're working a list of some kind. And that to me is like the most core definition of a, of a peak bagger. Yeah. Uh, do you have, uh, um, and not, not that it has to be answered, but do you know how many peaks, unique peaks you've climbed? I don't. I actually didn't count them individually. I saw that that was a thing nowadays. I used to count my vertical. Oh, um, yeah. I have an Excel spreadsheet that I kept year after year after year that had all of them, but it, it it's definitely in the hundreds. Yeah. Um, if I the guess, probably 500-ish. Wow. Uh, you know, in- It's a in, lot. So that's a lot. Yeah. Washington. Do you have any uh, most memorable peaks that stand out when you have 500? That's a lot. There's a bunch of memorable peaks in there and probably no single favorite, but is there one that really stands out that you're proud of, proud of and feel was a big, a big accomplishment for you, or just was just one of the most memorable moments for you? Your memorable has different definitions to me. So I'll give you a <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, can. can be bad, right? They're memorable. <laughs> right. So Very good like, point. Oh my God, I almost died. Or, you know, they're <laughs> memorable because of the people that you were with, or the area was just so jaw droppingly beautiful. Um, I think one of my, you know, because this PNW, one of my most significant ones, and this is a memorable one, it's a simple one. Uh, when my daughter was six years old, I put her in a backpack and we marched up to Winchester Peak. And slept the night in the fire lookout there. And when we woke up the next morning was still to this day, the most beautiful sunrise I have ever seen in my life. Um, the only way to describe it was a gradient of purple to red and orange and yellow and studded in there were these, what, what I call like these jellyfish clouds, you know, they had a very particular shape where they were sort of animal like on top. And then they had a little tail on the bottom and they just repeated across wow. the sky. Sounds and I amazing. At the sky and I literally stood there and I was brought to tears with how stunningly beautiful it was all lit up from the sunrise. And then you have shucks and then Baker beside you and it was just one of these moments where I stood in awe. Um, and so that one was particularly memorable because I felt like I got to share it with, you know, my family and they got to see, you know, a lot of the times you don't have those moments, especially like with peak baggers, your family doesn't want to suffer with you. They do not. <laughs> 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 right. It's a special set of friends yeah. <laughs> and who are also peak baggers who understand the insanity of the drive. <laughs> I just won't. Go to trash peaks with you, you know? Uh -huh. um, and so that one was, I think. Well, even when they're a beautiful peak, some people don't just want to get up in the middle of the night and drive five hours, climb a mountain yeah. for 15 hours, thing, and yeah. then drive back for five hours and then go to work. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> totally crazy to them. Um, I think some of the other spectacular locations, I got to, you know, give a shout out. Um, some of the volcanoes are just absolutely jaw dropping. Like I got to, you know, Mount Rainier, that whole area is world class. Um, some of the terrain in there is absolutely spectacular. Um, other really memorable ones to me. Well, there's a reason why so many uh, big mountain climbers spend their time training on Rainier. I mean, you get everything, yeah. anything, and everything. For sure. So Rainier is definitely on top. Um, really enjoyed Olympus and really enjoyed Glacier Peak for different reasons. Um, Glacier, because it just has this, uh, if you go there and, and it's melted out, um, it just has a spectacular geology that I really, really enjoyed. I, I like poking at rocks and I like shiny things. And so uh, Glacier Peak has just this sparkly rocks everywhere, such a variety of terrain that you walk that, through. That is the thing. It, it's different all the way throughout your journey. Like it's really spectacular to go back. Yeah, and... you get the old growth, you really get the lakes, you get every aspect of that, you know, volcano. It just keeps on changing in terms of the terrain. So I really enjoy that one just because of the terrain you walk through. And, and Olympus was similar to that, right? You have sort of this grand valley bottom you get up onto the glacier and you have to do a little bit of a you know a little bit of a climb to the top and so um 
I'm a sucker for glaciers. I really like glacier country. So anytime I get to look at glaciers, be around glaciers, um, those are kind of my my favorite um, memorable so ones. You somehow transitioned from being afraid of the dark to climbing <laughs> all of these mountains. Yeah. Who, who were your mentors and the those people that really helped guide you and help teach you and build your confidence and your abilities to do this? Um, it's a combination of things. So you know, I do recommend that if people are starting out for the first time, it's really good to take a mountaineering course if you've never done one. Um, I find that if you just hang out with your friends, it's always going to default to whatever knowledge and behavior they have. And and that may not be up to snuff with kind of- <laughs> You might be picking up some bad habits. <laughs> gonna teach you. Uh, I think it's good to get a good foundation. So, you know, I started with Canada West Mountaineering School as some of my first courses to make sure that, you know, when I was on a glacier travel, I kind of knew what I was doing. I wasn't going to let my partners down. Like I felt that it was part of my obligation to show up well to for others, right? Like I don't want to be that weak link. Um, so I definitely took courses for myself um, through, through mountaineering, um, through guide services, right? To if there was some kind of technique that I specifically wanted to work on, then I think there's like no better dollar to dollar ratio than getting a professional guide for a day. Um, I think they're amazing. Um, and I think if you can't afford one, then I think the mountaineering schools are the next best bet. So here we have the Alpine Club of Canada. People like me who have been in it for 30 years will come and teach you for free. And I think the memberships are like, you know, 20, $40, whatever they are. Um, it's super economical and they'll always put on courses throughout the year that that help members really get into it. So that's where I started. You know, I I, I started with those two. Um, also, well, if you think I mean, about it, even in, in a business yeah. environment, continuing education is critical to make sure that you maintain your skills and your knowledge in order to do your job for people in yeah. the backcountry. So it saves our lives. So you have to, you, you need to start there, but you also need to continue to learn and develop evolve. and listen and evolve um, yeah. in order to be a safe climber. Yeah. I, it's, it goes back to the old saying, you know, there's, there's two types of mountaineers. There's the <laughs> bull mountaineers and old mountaineers, and there's no old bull. Old, mountaineers. No, no old bull. <laughs> so those are the two extremes. You either get really complacent and you think, you know, and you're like, oh, I have 30 years. What else do I need to learn? Um, and that's super dangerous. I don't think anybody should ever get into that mindset. I mean, even with, you know, current systems, if we think at crevasse rescue, you know, everybody used to do a Z pulley. Now it's all about the drop loop, right? Like yeah. there's efficiencies that evolve through time. Um, and even if you think you know it, take the class again, because I guarantee you it has evolved. Um, the mountaineering community has found better, safer, more efficient ways to do these things to move through terrain and and keep learning. Um, the other thing I think you can do is is really go with people who are better than you, right? Um, which is tough when you're a new member. So it's always like, well, I want to go with these people, but they're so intimidating. How am I ever going to get to go with these people? Yeah. Um, so I think that part of the process is slower. And to be honest, my journey started with doing the simple stuff. I find that now a lot of the time, especially on Facebook, people see you do these things um, and they they don't have context for who or what you are. So they assume that they can just repeat that without the 20, 30 years exactly. behind this yeah. that they can't see. Right. And so that I think is where we're kind of in a really dangerous spot right now is what people can't see is that, you know, I've spent 20 years doing these things and I didn't start off by climbing Mount Rainier. I started off by doing a hundred much simpler hikes that tested me in other types of snow and scree and terrain mm -hmm. before I would ever take on something like Mount Rainier. Right. Um, you know, the dangerous part that we see in SAR is you see all these Facebook posts and people are like, they wake up and they fly in from some other part of the country and they're like, I can do it. I'm fit. I'm Colorado yeah. fit or I'm whatever fit. Um, they but, march off into the mountains unprepared. Don't know anything about the 10 essentials, let alone <laughs> any technical yeah. things. But um, how do you stay in shape to get out in the mountains? Is it all I you mostly 
are in the mountains and that's enough or are you a runner are you a cyclist or what do you do um honestly it's keep moving in the mountains um yeah. i used to be a runner so i had this theory at one point in time that if i was a, a trail runner an ultra runner that i could do that much more mountain um and so i started you know with 10k races and half marathons and full marathons and then i went to ultras and i found that it just destroyed my hips and my knees oh yeah uh, so I took a pretty big hit just physically, you know, there's times when I was just like limping down the street, um, from, from the amount of, you know, distance that I would put on running. So I dialed that way back. Um, I think scrambling keeps you fit enough. Like if you go, you know, some at a couple of You're mountains, out regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. It's consistency, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's get out there once a week, every week, um, and you're going to maintain your fitness. And so that really is it. During transition times, I switch a little bit to the climbing gym. Like if it's puke and rain outside, like it does a lot in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> so October, November are, are, are sketchy in between months. Um, then I just go, I go to the climbing gym and I hit the ropes and I play with sort of more of the upper body strength. Um, and the rest of the time during the winter, it's, I mean, snowshoeing and break and trail with your skis will keep you damn fit. Um, oh yeah. That's hard yeah. work. What, um, getting close here on, uh, starting to wrap up just a couple of other questions for you real quick. I'm curious. Um, so you've been in the group for in P and W peak baggers for a little while now. What, what do you like most about the group? Um, I really like to see the social aspect of it. I like people, uh, posting their trip reports. I think those are incredibly valuable to the community and I would very much encourage people to keep it up. Um, I think it helps everyone, right? It's it's that the more you know, the more we can prepare for getting out there. I really like to see the support. You know, you'll see it through the 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 side channels, people looking for partners. Um, I've met some really cool people in the US. You know, I've like coming down from Vancouver all the time, I'm always looking for partners and I'll put out a message and yeah, I've met some really amazing individuals. So I think there's a, a great community there that I, I have really enjoyed getting to know on a personal level. Awesome. I, I, lo I love hearing that. Yeah, that's great. So uh, you talked about social media, people looking at social media. Uh, so you have your persona on social media. You're obviously a mountain climber, but what would people not know about you if they only knew of you from social media? Is there any other hobbies um, or things that you spend your time on other than cutting down alders and writing poems about your boots? Oh my gosh. Uh, I, well, I guess you might know it as secretly a creative person, secretly not secretly, <laughs> not what I do for my job. So, you know, when I'm not mountaineering, like I have sat on my couch and knit sweaters and, you know, oh, really? I, okay. You know, have sewn things and you know, whatever crafty little things I can do, I, I usually do. Um, I also used to love dance. I used to spend hours upon hours dancing. I used to do uh, professional Latin dancing, so salsa, cumbia, bachata, merengue. Oh, um, wow. In university. And so whenever somebody turns on like salsa music, I am so down for a dance. So, <laughs> that's for a nightclub. So I well, to... now I know where my wife and I can come for dance lessons. She's constantly uh, pushing me to do that. And somehow I find ways to weasel out of it, including even injuring myself <laughs> to not have to take the lessons. So yeah, we I might have to, we might have to hit you up on that. Good beats, man. I'm always up <laughs> dancing on mountaintops. Uh, yeah. Your uh, so your advice for people starting off in mountaineering and peak bagging. What what nuggets of wisdom would you want to pass along? Um, probably th three things. If I was to say this from a search and rescue perspective, I would say, don't go alone. Every person I've ever brought home has been basically a solo hiker, like almost 90%. Um, don't go alone. Bad things happen when you go alone. Find a buddy, find a friend. Um, and if you are going to go alone, you know, go to a trail that's well-traveled and super popular so that, you know, there's going to be people that are beside you and can help you. Like, don't go to remote, remote regions. Um, that would be, you know, sort of my rule number one. Rule number two 
I would say, um, you know, always bring a headlamp and always bring a spare battery pack for your telephone. Nowadays, um, those are the the two big things that we always find, you know, in SAR. Uh, people call us when there's like 2% battery life left in their phone and then it gets mm-hmm. cold dies yeah. so if you don't have a backup battery pack or a headlamp like it doesn't matter if you're going on on a sunny day and you think you're going to be there for an hour those things you should always 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 bring um you know above and beyond the obvious 10 essentials those are the the two things that i always say you know will help you really get out of a jam that we see most often um yeah hang out in the forums take a course sign up with your local mountaineering club that's where you begin Um, reach out to other peoples in the community that you see are always out there. Come say hi, you know, send, shoot me a message. Uh, Yeah. Speaking of that, where, where can people follow you? Obviously you're on Facebook because you're in the, the, the group and people can hit you up there. Is there anywhere else that you're on social media or any way that people can connect with you? Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I've got an Instagram account, but honestly the, the, the best way I think to reach me is, is on Facebook. Just send me a message, introduce yourself, say hi, or reach out to me on the forum. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to respond and hang out and plan some trips. Yeah. Yeah. So Maria, you've been great. You have a, a fascinating story. It's been fun hanging out with you and hearing about your journey from, uh, the uh escape and refugee camps to the mountains and to all your volunteering and thank you for all that work that you do it's important um so thanks for joining us today and for those who are listening thank you or if you're watching us on youtube uh thank you if you're not already doing so we talked about it quite a bit on here and this is new for you Uh, we are on facebook we have a pretty large group there that's where most of the community uh, activities and conversation and the trip reports and stuff are getting loaded, but we're also other places. We're expanding that. We're we're on Reddit. That's new. We are also on Instagram. We are on LinkedIn, believe it or not. Um, so we're always looking for other opportunities to connect with people. If you have any ideas or suggestions, let us know. We do have a website. A lot of people are sometimes shocked to hear that um, where we've got some exclusive content on there that you're not going to find in any of those other places. So make sure and check that out, including where we have, I always have to put a plug in for the merch, the hats and beanies and shirts. And we got a whole bunch of new stuff because people are constantly asking, Hey, Bill, can you add this? Um, So check it out. You might find something in there that you like. Um, Again, Maria, thank you so much for being here and everybody. uh, Thank you and hope to see you out in the mountains. You bet. Happy hiking, everyone.